stream is started. I can confirm, Mr. Chairman, the live stream has been started. Thank you. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Connected Communities Scrutiny Committee uh, being held on Friday, the 14th of October 2022. I'm Councillor Jonathan Lester and I will be chairing the meeting today. Uh, the, for those present in the meeting room, if the fire alarm sounds, please leave the building by the nearest exit and make your way to the fire assembly point in the car park. Agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are being uh, part of public viewing and can be available on Herefordshire Council's website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on Herefordshire Council's YouTube channel and is making a recording. <clears throat> Please ensure that recording quality is maintained uh, by speaking clearly as possible and to keep background noise to a minimum. Please ensure all of the devices that you have, mobile phones, etc., are turned to silent. Others are permitted to film, photograph, and record public meetings, provided this does not disrupt the business of the meeting. Uh, there are no members of the public <coughs> in the meeting uh, at present, but if they appear and wish to uh, film or photograph the meeting and you don't want that to happen, please raise your hand and make uh, me aware of that. Only committee members present in the meeting room may vote. However, all of the committee members who are attending this meeting today able to vote are in the room. We have another uh, other people in attendance and virtual participants. And so can I ask you to raise your hand by the function on the uh, Zoom um, to uh, notify us when you want to make a contribution. And I would ask, that everyone who makes a contribution to the meeting to address the committee, just explain your role, uh, your name, and uh, why you're here. Thank you. Right, first item on the agenda is to receive apologies from absence, uh, 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 and we have received an apology from Councillor Hay. And I take it though that we have uh, uh, item two, we have no substitutions for Councillor Hay. No, no, sorry, okay. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Agenda item three is declaration of interests. Um, do any members wish to declare any interest in any agenda item? No. Thank you. Chairman? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Councillor Andrews. Yeah. Just, so, just sorry, um, it's non Goomy, um, because obviously we've got Balfour BT and we're discussing that today. I do, uh, a good friend of mine, son in law, does work for Balfour BT, so I wanted to say that just to clarify. Personal interest, personal interest, but no pecuniary interest. No, in there. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Kind of need to clarify. Thank you. Uh, next item is Can I just declare a personal interest? I know someone um, who works. I'm related to someone who works for Balfour Beach. Yeah, well, there were, isn't they? <laughs> okay, well, there again, another personal interest declared that the pecuniary interest is associated. Thank you. Right, agenda item four is uh, questions from members. Chair, Chairman, I suppose I've been explained a bit. Um, I, Councillor Kenyon. I occasionally um, help a mate out who subs to Balfour BT, but it's not a non pecuniary interest because. Well, I don't feel it is. Okay, but you've declared an interest because of your association. Uh, okay, thank you. So, agenda item four is questions from members of the public. Uh, there are no questions that have been received uh, on this occasion. And agenda item five is questions from members of the council, and no questions have been received from councillors. Okay, so we'll move on swiftly to the roles and objectives of the Connected Communities Scrutiny Committee. And you can see from agenda item six, it sets out the, uh, the, the, uh, the objectives, uh, the constitution in accordance with the constitution, and the summary of this committee and what it will be focused on, and the overall objectives. So do I have a proposal that we accept those terms of reference from the committee? That's proposed by Councillor Durkin, seconded by Councillor Andrews. Are we all in agreement to accept the uh, proposal? Councillor Kenyon? Yep. Okay. 
Thank you very much. And obviously, all of the, the terms and conditions will be agreed by the other scrutiny committees as well. All in agreement with no abstentions or any against. Item seven is the annual work plan. Uh, the work plan is listed in the agenda and covers a multitude of issues that this committee will be looking at in the coming months. Um, if, if any member wishes to review that work programme as we go on, then that can be addressed at uh, future meetings. But are we all happy to, to note and accept the work programme as it's set out in the agenda? Have a proposal. Councillor Bose is proposed. Councillor Kenyon seconded all in agreement. Brilliant. Thank you. <clears throat> so that leads us swiftly on to agenda item eight, which is the main item of the meeting today, which is to discuss um, moving forward with regard to the public realm future operating model. And we're joined today by Officers and Councillor Harrington, and also Councillor Davis, who's attending by Zoom. Councillor Davis, sorry, you've got your hand up. I have, yeah. Um, yeah. Apologies. Um, yeah, so I'm Councillor Gemma Davis, and my role in this is that I'm the person that deals with major contracts so they were talking about public realm it's actually a trio of cabinet members that deal with this so it's myself it's councillor harrington and the reason why i had my hand up is councillor harvey is also the other one but she um, gives her apologies to the committee for today thank you for that clarification you're most welcome and i also see that um who else have we got attending by zoom yeah we've got ross cook and we've got Alex Deans as well, who's the author of the report. Uh, so you're most welcome, thank you very much. And we will try to spot you when you raise your hands virtually. So, um, right, so to the, um, uh, to the committee, you have um, some key people who will be involved in doing some of the thinking with regard to how the public realm contract will be shaped if the uh, coming months. Uh, so uh, I would be inclined, unless <clears throat> unless anybody has any objections, to crack on with the questions that we can ask uh, officers and uh, Councillor Harrington. Um, sometimes we have presentations, but um, I think the presentations end up having questions fired at them, so we might as well just crack on anyway. Unless you want to just. Uh, but what I would just say is. Um, Councillor Harrington, did you just want to a quick intro. just a quick intro and just uh, take us through your thinking on this issue and then we'll start firing our questions at uh, all, all those involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. So um, <clears throat> we obviously have a contract, a public ground contract. Currently it's with Alpha BT, but it's the nature of the contract, not the provider. That's the, the thing that we want to discuss. Um, we had a 10-year contract which started in 2013, which was able to be extended by uh, a certain amount of years every so often on performance. Um, we thought this was the right opportunity, the right time to review the contract, to see if the model is correct for us. So this is not a, a, a pro or anti valve meeting thing. This is a, is a model we like for Herefordshire. How do we work up, you know, what, what will work for us in, in, this, uh, in this county and the circumstances that we are now. And so the work that Alex has done at the request of um, Councillor Davies and, and myself and, and officers is to, to look at the options that we have moving forward um, to see whether or not we would change things to do things differently or we'll stick with what we've got. That's basically the gist of it. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. Councillor Davies, you've got your hand up. Right, okay. Um, Photo finished there. I think Councillor Durkin just got in there first. Um, so, Councillor Durkin and then Councillor Bartram. Thank you, Chief. <coughs> My, can you only hear me? No, it's not. Hello? It's not. Stop switching. Yeah, yeah, lights not on, but. No one's at home. Um, should the determination of the future operating model be made by Cabinet? Because it, we've got a forming of 
at the, at the present time because we've got the form of a new cabinet administration in May 2023, which potentially may be different. Uh, we want to allow sufficient time for the development, consideration, and consultation on the future of the model options and proposals. So, my question is succinctness is probably the right time to do that. I should be waiting. Uh, well, I, I, in relation to what I said earlier, uh, Councillor Durkin, is that we're not actually looking at, we're not actually making a determination. So the cabinet decision is simply should we be reviewing it. So that's essentially what we're asking. And it's a little bit early in a sense to be coming to scrutiny, but we obviously we've got on your input. So that's precisely the question that uh, you've asked. If you think it's pertinent, we need to just be asking what we need to be looking at. Uh, in the case of what we will achieve, that will be done at a later date. And it will be done, as you say, after the administration may no doubt, or well, depending on where we go. But yeah, and, and the point of wanting to have, uh, so as you know, we've asked for uh, a representative of each of the main political parties to join us informally in the working group, is that we want um, we want consensus and continu continuity on this. That's a lot. It's going to be a similar question, actually, what, why the timing? So could you elaborate a bit on that, John? Or, I mean, is it is it something that's come about from work that officers have done? That has led you to this point, or did somebody just have the idea we ought to we ought to review this? We haven't reviewed it in many years or whatever. It's time to do it. Somebody's going to do it. Yeah, um, it's, it's it's just elaborate. Yeah, a bit on that. thank you. So it's, it, it is it is probably more the latter than anything else. Um, so so essentially, when we came to the administration, we realised that there was a, a, a contract that was ten years with extending, uh, you know, over the next ten years potentially, um, and we. We had some qualifications against us in terms of capital work, and so, so there were some questions about whether we were getting value for money out of capital work. Now, that's not accusing Balfour or whoever our public ground contractor is of not giving us value for money, but it's saying, do we as council have the mechanisms in place to be able to make sure that we are getting value for money out of capital work? And that led on to say, well, actually, let's review the revenue aspect of the public ground contract. Let's see if, if this contract works for Herefordshire. Um, as I said, Balthas are pretty good contractor, to be honest, compared to some that we've dealt with. It's just a case of, does this work for us? Um, like everything, you know, Councillor Bartram, you know, you want things to start and happen quickly. And by the time we stand, that's actually in place, it's two or three years down the line. But that is, that's why it's, it's coming about at this stage. Okay, thank you. Councillor Devil. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it would be helpful, I feel, um, if maybe not at this meeting now, but uh, some information provided um, where you believe that the existing contract is lacking or requires improvement, because at the moment it's a case of nobody knows what's going to be considered fine, but what's the starter? What are we looking at that's lacking? Okay, so I can, I can give you a, a kind of personal view on that. It, it, so on a person, and that is a fair point, on a personal view, um, you sort of, you, I, I need to understand whether having such an all-encompassing contract, so the contract, the nature of the contract that we've got with Alpha BT at the moment is a very, very comprehensive contract. So for example, Telford and Regan use Alpha BT as a public ground contractor, but they've kept their technical staff in-house. So they, they're, they're kind of road engineers, they're bridge engineers, and to some extent they're inspectors remain in house. And so what happens is <coughs> Talbot and Recon, their officers, will make the plan, which gives them flexibility to change things around in a way that's perhaps more politically driven sometimes and you know, <coughs> respond to you know, requests from, from uh, politicians or ward members or whatever. Uh, and then they give that plan. So they make so every year the annual plan is made by officers within the council and they give that plan then to Balfour to deliver. The nature of the contract that we've got currently with Balfour BT is we give them everything. So we say to them, well, we need you to draw the plans up. You've got all the engineers, you've got all the staff, you've got the inspectors. We don't have that. And so 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 my view is, is that <clears throat> does that contract work well for us or not? And that's probably the crux of the issue. Just to follow up on that, Chair, I think it would be helpful if sometime the committee could have um, an understanding of, of where you consider that the current model is, is, is falling short of what you believe it should be. Sure. Uh, I can answer, I can hardly answer that now before Councillor Davis has got a hand on. She might not come 
but partly answer that in this sense that I think the way the contract set up now, that I don't think we as a council necessarily have been able to monitor correctly. And I think that some of that, you know, is quite frankly at, at our door. So we set a contract up, which is, you know, which is difficult to tell us. Um, to manage properly if we're not actually a bit heavier in stuff than we are at the moment. Uh, that's not the okay. case. Councillor Davis, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of things there that I think we need to unpack a little bit. So firstly, regarding the contract itself. So if we consider that within the first couple of months of being in administration, we asked for a review to be undertaken by PwC into the contract and contract management. I believe that the previous administration also asked for something, but from a slightly different angle, which was, is the contract fit for purpose? So there were two different angles here. As you're aware, and I think it's been in a number of cabinet meetings, um, it's come back, the reports have come back to say, actually, the issue here is around our contract management and how we are able to um, manage such a major contract. So that piece of work is undertaken. And now we are, we, you know, you'll see new officers in the room. You'll also see some of the new plans, which it may be really advisable to come before the committee from what Councillor Durkin was just saying. Um, for you to see some of that progress but I think that further part of it is that now we have in a sense got our ducks in order it is absolutely appropriate that we look at the contract if you think about how long ago the contract was signed um the objectives even from a even from a really wide perspective of now we're considering, you know, used to be once in a in a hundred year floods, we're getting probably every year at the moment. Um, actually, it's right and proper for us to look at those and say, actually, those objectives that we had at that time, are they still the right objectives for what we require now in Herefordshire? Um, I know from all of the members that are here that you will have probably the most complaints from people regarding public realm services. And Therefore, that's why we're reviewing the contract. Now, it may very well be that we review the contract, we, we review what the public realm covers, and we say, actually, we think this is right. Um, Councillor Harrington and I would say, we think that there are parts of it that don't work as well anymore. And actually, do we need to have another look at what they are? So for example, you'll see around compliance and our OPIs and our KPIs, so key performance indicators and operational performance indicators. If you look at some of those, we're consistently hitting 100 percent. So what you would say is, well, there's no issue here. Well, what actually we should be looking at is, are we asking the right questions in the first place? And I would really like to pass over to Mark Avril to explain about the contract mechanisms and when we can when it's appropriate for us to check. So we know that we've got things such as contract extensions embedded within the document, but we also know when that contract would come to an end. And I think it would be really helpful for the committee to understand that, to go back to Councillor Durkin's original question, is now the right time for us to do that? Maybe if you if we have the timeline and you could understand that timeline, you would see that it's absolutely right and proper that we do it now. So if it's with permission, Chair, um, I think it would be quite helpful for Mark Avril to take over on this bit. Thank you, uh, Councillor Davis, for your uh, contribution. Um, well, no one's taking over anything. Um, I'm just going to I've got people asking questions, and I, I think your contribution has really set the scene, and I really appreciate that. But I, I'd much rather have the scrutiny committee ask the questions of the people present rather than stray into a presentation. If those points become relevant to answering the questions, then I think that would be really, really helpful. But it I'm wasn't for the away. presentation, Chair, sorry. It wasn't no, about the presentation. It was no. in response to Councillor Durkin's question around times. And yeah, the yeah, two things I, weren't yeah. called back. Yeah, I, I appreciate the point that you've made, and I think that's really helped the committee understand that. But I've got people lining up with their questions, and I want to try and get that flow of question and answer going, please. Um, but thank you for that. That's, that's set the scene, and I think that's really helpful. Can I come in on a particular point? Yes, please, thank ask you. your question. It's just, just to follow up on what I was saying earlier, I, I've got no objection to the, any contract being reviewed. I think it's more than proper that it's reviewed. But if we're going to be scrutinising, we need the information. Uh, things like um, what Councillor Davis said, the Passport House Coopers, um, 
review recently. That would be very helpful for this committee and other information from the other parties who have reviewed it. So we get a complete set of documents that we can consider and not just a proposal somewhere into the future, we're going to do something, which is how I see this presentation, no disrespect intended. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Kenyon, you had a question and then Councillor Boats next. Oh, we have got a question. I've got a few actually. Um, so if, if people want to take them down relevant, if they think they need to jump in, please do. Um, I'll just kick off with um, operational stuff. Who actually checks? The operational staff and at what stage does the council actually check the work that we're paying for in terms of the technical checking yeah there's, yeah. there's a problem there's a hole in the road someone's gone and fixed it when does the council actually go and check that hole in the road so if it's, if it's something that a subcontractor has done like um i don't know if the utility companies come in we've now got a street works team which got permanent permanent people go and do it but in terms of the work that will be the nature of the contract is there's no one to check it on the average council side okay uh, I think well, that, that could that could be an issue. There isn't regular checking. Do you want to come in on that? I'll just throw it before you do that. Uh, the Zoomers at the moment, they're zooming around Herefordshire, or Hereford, yeah. certainly, and they're causing all sorts of problems and we're finding them further down the road. Yeah. Um, well, that's 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 a much better system because what we've got there is so we've got street works. So we've got a permanent team that's come in for the first time ever in Herefordshire about two years ago. So we've got an actual dedicated set of people. So Zoom and any utility now have to pay a charge and, and slot in to when they're going to do things and we we can pay we pay people to go out and have a look at that work um, not always automatically i don't think it's sensitive on, on responding to sometimes it's done as, as sort of ad hoc but mostly in responding to complaints but that's that's slightly separate from the work that Valve is doing yeah, yeah. So, so in terms of who checks the work Balfour Balf beach's contract is, is is framed in a way that Balfour beach are checking their own work. So they, they have a, a business management system and a, and, a, and, a, and a management system that sits behind all of what they do. So they're very process driven. Their supervisors will task their, their operators, operators in the morning, the operators will go and do the work. And then as part of the Balfour BT normal part of the business, they will go out and check a proportion of that work. No, get that. That's it. How much did that cost? Us as a council. So, so that's, that's included as part of the, the cost of services. Alpha BT every month submit to us a, an application for payment. And as part of the application for payment, we will also go out and look at elements of work that are done on the ground. And we also use the technology system they use in terms of confirm, looking at the before and after photographs of work that's done. For again, for a, for a small sample of, of the works to make sure that what we're paying for is what's been there. I've got that mark. So who is who? We. Who is we? So, so we is the contract management team that sit within my directorate. Okay. If I can just come back on that, Councillor Kenyon. Yeah. The, 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 the issue is, as far as I'm concerned, and the nature of the contract is that we don't have a huge amount of Heritage Council contract, uh, uh, Heritage Council technical staff going out to check work. The nature of the contract is that we rely on inspection and performance from founders. That's something that the committee needs to consider as a model or yeah. otherwise. And, but you were saying earlier about Salford and Rekin, who don't do that. They've got engineers that could set the plans out, and I'm sure part of their role, part of their job is to actually do what we're talking about. Well, and not keep them that rather than pay Balfour Beatty to do it or whoever they've got there, that money is saved and goes towards paying their wages. Well, well, it'll be, it, they, won't, we, they won't be paying it to Balfour, they're paying it to someone else. But yes, Telford and Reek, in the way that they do things is that they kept their, a lot of their technical staff in house or all of their technical staff in house. So they'll make the plan up for the, for the year and say, this is what needs doing, these roads need doing, these ditches need doing, and they give it to Valve and say, you deliver it. They've also kept their inspectors. So they've got their own road inspectors and street inspectors, which are in-house. So they'll go around and they'll check the work that's being done by whoever the subcontractor is, in this case, Valve will be And just to say, I don't think they're doing a bad job, to be fair, but we need to look at different systems going forward, certainly, and stripping things out. Um, to me, it's a bit confusing, and I'm sure Gemma will have a bit to say on this, you know, we, we've got um, people, the, the, the rubbish that's collected from our houses. We've got a company that comes in and does that, but we pay Balfour to do the bins and the littering and that sort of stuff. It, could that be stripped or should it be stripped out of, the, uh, out of the contract? Is it what they do? Or can we can we get someone to do it privately within Herefordshire for a better price? You know, so, this is the sort of thing we need to look at at the contract. Yeah, absolutely. Time. So so that's uh, exactly the issue, is that the contract was a very broad, it was very 
comprehensive contract. And General will answer this better than me, but it was a very broad, comprehensive contract that had all sorts of things in there, including public rights of way and traffic regulation order team or team, traffic management team, which aren't traditionally always in big public realm contracts. Things like parks and maintenance of spaces, green spaces and street cleaning could, could come out of that contract. The issue that we have is that the, the nature of the contract that we signed in 2013 means that you've got to be careful how far you deviate from, from that original agreement. So some things can slot in, slot out. Um, and I suppose the crux of the conversations that we'll be having is if we want to change things more significantly, can we do that within the existing contract or will we have to re redo it? I'm going to continue asking questions, Jan. Yeah, I've got a few more to go. Yes, I mean, what's really good is if they're, you know, all to do with a similar topic. Yeah, yeah, it, it, same and thing. Then, um, and then come back at another time when the topic changes. Yeah, no, absolutely, you'll get that. So on, on a similar vein then, um, I look at the grass cutting, the hedge cutting, visual splays and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's a lot of this, again, there's private companies that could do that. If we're looking at changing this contract, perhaps we need to look at breaking this down. Because because Balfour's would be quite happy to do what they're, what they're good at. And, and, and not since I know the guys that do a lot of this stuff, and they quite happily work for whoever came along. And they work for the guys that before Balfour BT and it might even want to come back in house. Um, also, on a similar vein, it's like when, when we do road resurfacing, you know, the, um, the Balfour guys go and do the drainage and that sort of stuff. They do all the sort of build all the trains up, make it all ready. So rather like the preparation for when you paint the house, all the work is in the preparation. And then when you slap the paint on, i.e. tarmac, that's the easiest bit. So a lot of the work is done by the Balfour, Balfour BT guys. Um, but then the tarmac uh, contractors come in and we're paying sub subcontractors sub coming in, we're paying Balfour BT, we're paying that. So we're kind of paying twice. So for me, it almost looks like do we need to look at the way that's done where we, we don't pay a, a, a management fee for that sort of stuff? And rather like Telford and Rekin, if we've got the technical, if we set the plan, we've got the engineer, engineers to check it, surely they can do the uh, ordering and that sort of stuff as well. So I'm just kind of looking yeah. at that side of things. Um, so, so, so in relation to that, I mean, that's a very good point because, you know, if you look at the way Balfour's managed the contract, they always sub well, they don't always, but mostly subcontract. So they will be subcontracting the grass cutting to, to local companies. They'll be subcontracting the tarmacking to probably probably someone like Tarmac in Kington. So so in a way they they are very often more of a management um, kind of team rather than a technical team. So the issue then is if we did it ourselves, there would be a cost to doing that. We need to understand that cost because people will be on our books, which is either a good or a bad thing. So it's absolutely a potential way to look at things and whether you think you you know we get better value out of that or whether actually the fact that a subcontractor is taking <coughs> those kind of costs of you know salaries and pensions and everything else out of our budget that that's all the things to be considered then Gemma maybe no sorry, sorry she Gemma. Didn't the call. okay she did talk okay but yeah exactly what we should be looking at okay the next question is from Catherine Bates thank you um, I think, as Mark said, part of our issue is the managing the contract, and I don't think we've done so well at that in the past. And I don't think at the moment we can prove that we're getting value for money. And, and that's one of my key issues with the contract that we've got now. I think we need to look at different operating models and we need to specify what sort of models that we are looking at, not just concentrate on that. But I think part of the issue has been the fact that we don't have the technical resource in house and we don't have the monitoring in place that maybe we should have done. And, and that's one of my things, regardless of what model we use, we've got to be able to have the technical staff to monitor it and make sure that what they're saying is true. And, and Mark mentioned about um, they get a monthly application for payment and the contract management team check that. So is that technical staff that check that? Do they go out and actually check it or are they just relying on a report saying, yes, yes we did it? And finally, the question would be for me, what would be the implications if we came out of this contract and, and you know went to a different model? What would the implications be? Because obviously you've got staff employed by the, the contractor who we're using at the moment and, and there would be Cheapy issues, I expect there. But um, is there financial implications? Just what sort of thing would, would it affect? Okay, so um, the technical staff and the um, if you like the inspectors who are inspecting the work. Um, 
technical staff generally, the majority of councils I've worked for in, in the recent past have, have had a number of technical staff in-house, but they've always been topped up by a another provider. So a, a, a term consultant, um, Atkins, WSP, uh, of that, those sorts of ilk, uh, in terms of just making sure there's enough um, people on the ground to come do the design work you want to go and do. The nature of capital programmes and the nature of scheme work means that you do have to be able to flex your resource. And what you don't want is a massive resource in house that is in effect under tasked. So it becomes really expensive. When we go and look at the application, so the application has two aspects to it. We need to make sure that the, the numbers are correct. So we pay, if it says a million pound on the, uh, the bottom line, does it all add up to a million pound? But we also then We'll go on site to check to make sure that the work during during the, the period we'll go on site that the, the CMT team members will go on site to look at works in progress to see what we're up to to see where we're working and to make sure the works that have been ordered have been undertaken. When we do the um, the valuation at the end of the month, they can also look at within really confirm every time Balfour's repair a defect. Photograph will be taken before by the inspector when the inspector identify the defect. The team will then photograph the defect once repaired. So they can always, if they're not been able to see that particular <coughs> defect and that's on their audit track, they can look on the screen to see the photograph of the repair. I've used that elsewhere and it works really well in terms of being able to see the quality, et cetera, et cetera. As long as you've given the, the, the operatives training as to don't stand 50 yards away from it when you take a photograph, stand up fairly close so you can see what you've, you've actually done. But there is that mix of compliance on the ground. Is it have we actually done what we've done and compliance in terms of the numbers? So, in your experience, then, that the best I don't want to put words in your mouth, one of the best models was the fact that you had some technical staff and some consultants that could back up those staff. But not at the moment, my understanding is mostly we have no technical staff really to think of and they are marking their own homework. Um, so, so I've, I've worked on three iterations of this contract across different different authorities, um, and worked on different other different forms as well. So, so the the technical staff, whether they're sat in HC's office and work and get paid for directly by HC, or whether they sit in BBLP's office and get paid for by BBLP, will generally be local people delivering local services, and they will have a pride in what they go and do. The ability of Balfour's then to be able to sell those people out to other contracts, if if we drop below that that level of work we can go and do, take some of the risk away from the council. So we haven't got to worry about Balfour's staff having enough work in their own office. They can sell that resource out. And again, my experience is we do that very well as contractors to make sure our, our, our people are, are well deployed. In terms of what's the best model, the best model is one that works for you there is no best model out there otherwise with the whole of the uk would have an identical contract so contracts are about relationship if the relationship's right if the level of trust is right if everything's working as it ought and we know that if i've commissioned a length of road to be resurfaced 100 meters and i get 100 <coughs> meters of road resurfaced and the exact material i want it to be done then i'm a happy client so it, it is down to how the contract is managed how the contract relationships work and do we need to put more into that then? Because I think that's something, as a councillor, I'm always getting told by people, oh, they filled a hole in and two days later the hole's back again. And I'm sure every councillor here gets exactly the same from their residents. So do you think we need to, to look at that more, to check more, and to make sure that we are getting what they say we're getting? So over the past few months, Actually, actually, over the past year. So I've been here since April this year. So since I've been here, we've been working to um, build up the contract management team. Um, if you like to separate very clearly the role of commissioner and of the people who are managing the contract. So the, the commissioner is responsible just for that commissioning. So we've got the technical team. It's quite a small technical team who understand what they're commissioning. So you all know Bruce. Bruce Evans is, is one of our, our main, main operators in that field. Bruce will then work with the CMT team to make sure that what is commissioned is being delivered. The team in uh, CMT team is being bolstered. One person, another person joining next week, and the person joining the week after. They'll then be at full complement in terms of what we we need to go. Um, and those those team members will be 
trained to look at the particular annexes they need to look at, the particular aspects of work we're expecting them to be specialists in, but we'll also have that general feel across the rest of the annexes as well. So we've got redundancy in terms of people going leave and all that sort of thing, so we've been able to do that. I think you've got enough people in the CMT team once the team's up to complement to actually check the stuff that's out there on the ground. We just need to make sure they are on point and doing what they need to go and do. We need to use technology a bit more in terms of those failed defects, repaired one day, pops out, repaired the second day, because we shouldn't be paying for those. The, the repairs should be, if it's logged as a first time fix and it's permanent repair, it should last more than a year. And if it comes out the following day, it should be disallowed cost. So we do need to look at how we can use technology. Every defect will have a, a, a point in space. So we'll know where we are in, in, in terms of coordinates. So we should be able to use technology. So actually there's a defect here. There's one only three days ago within a radius. You know, we have to remember that our GPS isn't as accurate as, as we'd like to think it is. We can we should be able to do that, but that's a piece of work we've yet to go down the road of. Okay. Um, next question is Councillor Durkin, but I'll I'll ask my question first because I'm on the you. list too to ask Brilliant. questions. Um, what well, a, a question for Mark Avril, if if I may. At the end of the day, this is best value for money in terms of council taxpayers' money being spent on public realm contracts. And if, as, as Councillor Harrington has said, if it was all Herefordshire Council doing the work, then they'd have employment costs and all the beyond costs and operational costs. Then, because we have a Alphabetia at the moment working in partnership with us, they we pay them to, to deliver a service and then they have their own costs and all of the, the, the costs they have. You mentioned several different models and the fact that one, you know, there's a different model for every scenario, but there must be a model, operating model out there that is a better model because it demonstrates more clearly better value for money than others. So surely there should be a template out there that is looking at getting better value for money than, than other models. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about a scheme or a situation where you're not putting resources into paying for somebody's resources to pay for somebody else's resources to then do the work. Um, so there must be a, an optimum. And if a authority out there is working with an optimum model, should we be exploring that further? I mean, you've mentioned Robert and Rekin, but I'm, I'm curious to think, you know, there must be others out there that are really optimizing this relationship when it comes to the best value for money. And should we be studying those very closely? Um, so certainly we can we can look at, I think, I think in, the, in the papers, we've got that, that suite of fully private sector to fully in-house. In so, it will depend on the council's appetite for risk as to what the council wants to outsource in terms of risk. Risk obviously costs money. Um, it will depend on how you wish to um, employ people. So if, we're, if we want to have a local contractor, and generally it'll be a tier two contractor or a tier one contractor, we'd have a different style of contract to come and do that sort of work. The way our contract is written here is so that we shouldn't be paying fee on fee. Um, so you should only pay one fee. Um, the rest of the fee should be should be taken out there because it's not it's not what we should be doing. It, it, you're absolutely right. We shouldn't be paying subcontract, 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 and multiple fees on top of it. So we shouldn't be we shouldn't be looking at that. But there will always be a need, no matter what contract style you have, to subcontract at some point because of the the way the market works, because of all all that we have. It's important to remember that bigger contractors have a bigger share of the market, which means they can get more competitive prices for materials. Um, they can get better prices for plants and equipment. They are generally at the forefront of systems optimization. So all the developments in the highways industry will come from the tier one providers. Um, tier two will very quickly try and adopt those, but it's a slow process in, in some instances, bringing them on board. As I say, there is no single contract model out there. You can go to every single local authority in, in England and now each have a different model. It may look the same from the outside, but be slightly different flavor for each one. It's like um, 
but it's just a, it's a box of snobs. It's, it's all different colours, all different different shapes. So it, it is very much what, what the council wants, what, what are its options, what's it looking to contract for? So this contract, as John said, is very much a very broad contract when it originally let it. It was public realm, had FM in it as well. It had a whole raft of, of um, services in there that we no longer have in that contract. We've taken those out. But that was the aspiration of the council at the time, to outsource all of that operation. So it, it will depend on what the aspiration of the council is in terms of what its goals and objectives are and how it wants to deliver those and how it wants to package up and parcel those pieces of work out. Remembering, of course, at the end of the day, as a council, we just have to make sure we maintain our Section 41 duty under the Highways Act to keep the highway safe. And, and with leading on from that, when um, you say certain things have been taken out of the contract, I think public rights away and, and uh, traffic regulation orders, councils brought that back in. Um, and those are pretty clear, different direction decisions. Mm -hmm. But do you think there's the possibility with an operating model moving forward that there can be greater flexibility so that whoever our partner is, if we have you know, Alphabeti or uh, operating, we can suddenly change gear if we need to address certain issues that arise rather than have a, a, a situation where you just deal with those issues and we'll deal with these issues. Because there may be, we, we know historically we've had some emergency issues, and I'm thinking about the Mordford Bridge uh, and the, the, the Found Hope Road, where there were major issues that suddenly were sprung upon us. And you know, it, it raised the question, how do we deal with that? Uh, and how do we deal with that most expediently? And so sometimes you can't account for these situations, but is there a flexibility that we could have in a future operating model that can allow us to react to events that then uh, that the arrangement is open enough for us to react accordingly. So, so again, we can contract for anything. Um, it's just how you end up paying for that that element of work. So, if we're if we're saying to our provider we want a thousand men somewhere on standby or all women on standby, um, yes, that can be arranged. But there'll be a cost to arranging that to make sure those thousand people are always available. Um, one of the nice things about working with a tier one contractor, and, and I've worked again with a number of tier one contractors, in emergency situations, they will always pull the stops out because they've got the ability from a national perspective to pull in resource from elsewhere. So unless you have something like the winter of 2009-10, where the whole of the UK was completely covered in snow, generally local authorities and local contractors, we can do things together to work better together. So, um, we can we can move sorts around the UK. We can do all those sorts of good things that, as a if you were to operate as a as a sole entity in a very constrained way, that would make it quite difficult to do that. You wouldn't have those partnerships to be able to rely, rely on and lean on getting extra kit in, extra equipment in. Um, you, you, your your resilience would decline as a consequence, in my opinion. Councillor Harrington, you wanted to. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so just a couple of issues. So a couple of different issues in relation to Fanhope. That's a, a good example because there we've got the first complication of capital works. So our contract with Falcon Beach is obviously a revenue contract, um, but we have in the framework in the, in the framework that we've got, and uh, Councillor Davis will know more about this. But we've got the ability to not as tender for things openly. But to use Balfour's to do our capital works. And I think one of the complications we had was that when we came to this administration, we had that uh, issue of question of whether we, we were not getting, because it's, it's, it's important to be clear about that. It's not a question of whether we're getting value for money off someone like Balfour BT or whoever our public realm contractor was, but if we could demonstrate it. And we couldn't demonstrate it necessarily at the time. And that caused a complication at the time that was that was was difficult. And that that added that did add. To some of the problems that we experienced over uh, time, had. Um, in generally, um, in terms of as as Mark was saying, generally in terms of uh, a big contractor like that, where the value lies, of course they can do things that are probably a lot cheaper in some respects. They add a service charge onto things, or they, we have us they take 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 a fee for, for doing things in the contract. And if we did that directly ourselves, we might save some money, but we'd have the other costs. But then, what the the thing that I think about is 
a couple of issues. So, for example, one of the major benefits of having a big public realm tier one contractor is if you need something, you can get it. The reality is, and that's my personal experience, and I'll be open about this with Alfred and everyone else, is that's not always demonstrated to me. So, for example, there's a shortage of ecologists at the moment, generally, I think to be rare as hen's teeth. So, one of the advantages then of, of saying use a big public realm tier one contractor is you can drag a consultant or uh, ecologist out from Northumbria or something like that. <clears throat> the reality is that hasn't happened necessarily. So it's been difficult for me to see where the advantage of having a public realm contractor as tier one has actually translated to being able to do something more quickly on the ground. And in fact, that's when you've got to consider the balance and say, well, actually, if we just employed our own ecologists, um, would that be then, would that be better value? We'd, like, we'd have to pay for them. They have to be on the books in a sense. Um, more than we more than we've got now, but is that a better value? Because at least you've guaranteed that you've got them, and you can balance that out against the fact that you know Balthus can drive people in from everywhere else. Well, I'm not sure that's that's all been demonstrated recently, and that's partly because there's an issue with the, with the, it's not necessarily their fault; it's the issue with the the market. But then that that advantage goes slightly, you know, in terms of um, where we and, and just the final thing is that bringing things in house or doing anything like that has a cost to it and the changeover period has a, you know the changing of it has a cost which has to be factored in <clears throat> and then one of the things i always think about is that if we want more local communities to do things themselves or through their lensmen or whatever subcontractors is their value is the value in that worth uh, you know because very often if, if as i said the nature of the contract we have the balance is that they carry all the risks so they're, they're in control of our network really because that, that risk lies with them. So they're very cautious about, as any public realm contractor would be, they're very cautious about giving other people authority to do things on the network. Whereas if we was directly controlled by a council, we might be more comfortable, uh, comfortable with letting a parish councillor or a local contractor with the right insurances and, and licenses work on that road. And then we might get better value in one regard, but those consequences. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. Um, Next question is um, Councillor Durkin and then Councillor Kenyon. But while we're on the, while you mentioned it, talking about bringing things in house, we recently brought in house the uh, TRO and the uh, so traffic regulation order and uh, the um, the public rights of way. Can I ask you, Councillor Harrington, how's it going? <laughs> well, it's not going, it wasn't going as well as it should have done. And I mean, that's one of the issues when you bring stuff in house and that's something to consider when we make a decision about the contract fully, you, you, these things have got to be considered. Uh, it didn't help. <clears throat> it didn't help that when we brought um, both teams in house, that there was a project going on in Wales for 21 mile limits, and a lot of our staff were at the age of close to retirement and took a very lucrative opportunity to go and do other things. The fact that we've now added <coughs> the extra resource and the fact that we're now bringing in our own way of assessing things like SID bases, which I know is very close to how capable how Sturkins are means that we are we're getting there so no it's not it's not been as good as it should have been with you know but we're getting there we are I, i'm much more comfortable with the, and i think that's always going to be the issue is that will be an, an element of teething and you need to make sure you reduce that as much as you can yeah thank you uh, councillor durkin and then it's councillor Henry. thank you chairman um i'm going to refer back to my concern though with the timing in the review of the review and decision and the availability of available documents to inform any cross party members that committee that are convened. I'm looking at the papers today, item 48, risk management, and it says the one off funding required to develop and implement the FOM forward operating model has not been identified or secured. Question is, why not? How long will it take to secure it? Where's the funding coming from? And this all needs to be identified, in my opinion, to the committee that has re reviewed this. And item 47, which says that external legal advice has been obtained and options de detailed in the report. Once the council have a clearer position regarding the FOM future legal and contract advice, will be able to ensure any changes to contracts with Balfour Peter on route to new contract tables not put the council at risk. Again, we're waiting for a legal opinion that can be relied upon, as well as 
funding which needs to be determined and relied upon. Both of those points, how close are we? I'll come in first if you can let, uh... Yeah, sorry, could I just ask the committee, when you ask a question, can you tell us who you're asking the question to? Oh. And then everybody knows exactly who's in the Councillor Harrington. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Durkin. And then I shall palm it off onto uh, <laughs> Quite right. Mark. So, so I think I think as I said, the issue here again is that we're looking at we're looking at the point of do, this is, in, a, in a sense this has come early to scrutiny, and perhaps perhaps another opportunity might come a bit later. We're definitely going to have to come again. Yeah. So the question really today is, oh, should we be doing this? And, and the input we're asking members it, yourselves is. Is this something we should be doing? And then, in relation to the questions you're asking, those are very valid. You know, what 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 would be the mechanisms to make sure that we have those taken that advice and that we've got that that um, financial understanding in place, which is part of this work. So, if I just um... thank you, John. Um, so, as we look at the the cost of delivering any of these sorts of pieces of work. The actual cost of delivering this program will depend on the style of contract we choose. So the contract with Valve BT was written by an external consultant, uh, Bevan Britain, and that would have been mainly handled by Bevan Britain as a, as a, as a legal enterprise, as a legal, company, legal advising company. We need to understand which route we're looking to go go down in terms of the future operating model. If we're, if we're looking to extend, it will also be a, extend the existing contract will always be a lot cheaper than formulating a new contract. If we're looking at um, that another full externalization, that's going to be a, a, a big cost in terms of legal fees. If we're looking for a full internalization, then that's going to be a, a different cost in terms of HR, in terms of IT, in terms of getting all the other pieces in, in play. So until we, we, we're aware and know which route we're going to go down, we won't be able to give that firm cost um, of, of, of delivering that service. If I may come back to you, but thank, thank you for that. Um, I think I think we all know that. Um, but my point is, uh, I go back to what I earlier said, I think, in my opinion, this is too soon, as it is. It's not sufficiently detailed. And going back to your answer, Mark, you talked here about one-off funding required to develop and implement, implement the FLM. That's a basic sum of money, pounds and pence or whatever, that you are secured that you can play with, in inverted commas, mm -hmm. to obtain the information to give to us as a committee, so that, or, or the cross-party committee, so that they can then make a decision when it's, when it's the right track. And more importantly, I think the information regarding the contractual arrangement needing to be assured should, from a council perspective because if we get it wrong potential is quite horrendous to, to the to the council taxpayers of this county so in short we i don't know convince us with information that we can actually rely upon so part of the next phase of works, we'll be looking at the various models and coming back with a cost to the council of, of the various models of, of how we deliver them. Um, looking at a, a standard basket of services and then effectively operating those as the different contract types to give you that assurance of, of cost. Yeah. Um, Recognising that if we're looking at full flexibility, it costs more than a standard, very, very rigorously programmed service. Um, and in terms of developing that, as I say, we'll, we've got the costs up to developing that that model, uh, that raft of models. But then once we've got to a point where we, we're aware of the direction of travel, then we can finally hone the cost of delivery of the new contract or existing uh, adaptation of the existing contract. Thank you. What well, from, from HR, just to close it, yeah, close down, this is to you, Mark, and, and to Councillor Harrington as well. Um, hear what you say in a report here, and I can't put, put, bring it to hand at the moment. Oh, that's a really yeah. Item 2 of 48 talks about May 23, no result on the first of any, any decisions. That would be unfortunate. If there's good work to be done, let's make sure that it's done, uh, irrespective of party politics, <laughs> as it were. If we're going to get value for money for the residents uh, of, of Herefordshire, let's do it. And let's give the full information up front so that whoever makes the decision in scrutiny committee to get back to Councillor Harrington 
It's gold plated. It's, it's there. We know what we're doing. That's that's my concern yeah. at the moment. Is we seem to be running out of time, and it would be unfortunate if all the hard work that's going to be done between when this was put together and and March, beginning of March, if that was to disappear in a barley cabin somewhere, it would be unfortunate. Thank you, Jim. Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, Balfour Beatty, um, good or bad, I mean, uh, I, we need work doing, they do work. Uh, we, 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 we need services doing. Um, and they're a business in the day, they want to make the most amount of money they can. Right? I'm a businessman, I want to make the most amount of money I can. And that's what they should be doing all times. Um, we need to make sure we get value for money and we pay the least amount of money so our money goes further. So it's it's finding that sweet spot. And that's what we need to do is find the sweet spot. And I think this is hopefully where we're, where we're trying to get to. Um, has anybody asked Belfort, B, Belfort BC um, if there's some services they particularly don't want to do? You know, ask them. There may be something they think, all right, uh, we're not making the money on that, but we do it, or it could be, we could be done cheaper by someone else locally. So it's going to ask that question, speak to them. Um, you were talking about risk earlier, Mark, and uh, that risk is um, like tier one, tier two, and all that sort of stuff. But what I've seen in practice is um, gritted. Grit is a great example. Um, we never know when we need to grit. Um, it's all dependent on the weather. What I have seen with Belfaviti, it's really good practice. The guys that work on the roads in the day, if they go out gritting in, in the night, they then don't start until later in the afternoon. So that's that flexibility. So I think that's a really good thing that Balfour BT um, provide us. Otherwise, if we had to pay people to do the work in the day and in, you know at that night as well, the additional costs would, would run high. So that's a really good thing they do. Um, so that was like a more of a statement than a question. Um, we talked about price water haste earlier with scrutinising and that sort of stuff. That, I, as I understand, might be wrong completely. Tell me if I am, because a lot of people told them wrong. Every time I'm at home, I've told them wrong. Um, that was about the money. It's not about the work. It's not about materials or things. You know, there's, there's been times where uh, a pothole's been fixed. This, this go to potholes, so it's a good one, the public like them. And they've used the wrong material. And they've had to go back and repair it with a different harder, if it's on a corner with a lorries go around, all that sort of stuff. You understand, John? And Mark, I'm sure you do that too. Do, are we, are we, do we have to pay that twice? You know, so with that, with the scrutiny that goes on by Price Waterhouse, it's for the money. But who actually scrutinizes materials and really drills down into what the job, what they're doing? So it lasts for, um, what was it? Tracy down in Millwood, the uh, Belmont, the, the bridge was made. I think it was done, it could have been done with wood, it was guaranteed for 10 years, and it could have, it was done with a, like a plastic type of wood, it's guaranteed for 20 years. You know, what are we getting with the materials? Who's looking at those materials that are being used? Because once you put a liquor paint on something, it looks really sweet. If the plaster's going to fall off the wall in a few years' time, perhaps not so sweet. So who actually does that type of work? And the final thing for me, um, Paul, I'm going to use a crossing in your ward. Um, I, I'm not sure what went on with that, but um, I think both of BT, they got, they got their own national both of BT to come and do the job. I think it's fallen way behind, is it? Or there's, there's some sort of issue with it, which I don't think is... So both of BT locally got both of BT nationally in to do a job. They haven't done it. So who's responsible? Who's responsible for it being late? Because at the minute it's temporary, temporary lights there. I might be wrong, Paul. That should have been finished before the September, before the term started. So, who's responsible for that? Okay, then just to recap, Councillor Kenya, you know, three or four questions. Yes, yeah, yeah, um, uh, just to, for the benefit of everyone participating, if you just say who you're sending the questions to. So it's, so it's John, John and Mark. Okay, because because Councillor Davis has got a hand up as well, um, and I don't know if, um, but it would just help everyone if you nominate who you. Sending your questions to. I thought she was dropping the mic there. Chair, I can answer one or two. I think Chairman would be better answering the one about Price Waterhouse too, because perhaps Mark can answer more technical one about. Okay, so we'll go to we'll we'll ask Councillor Davis if 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 we may about the Price Waterhouse uh, question because you, you did mention it at the beginning. So it'd be helpful if you could just 
Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Chair, and also thanks for the questions, uh, Councillor Kenyon, around that. Um, so, PwC, you're right, won't go into all of the materials, etc. but actually when they're looking at best value, etc., what they're looking at and what we asked them to do was come in and tell us, are we managing the contract right? So are we doing all of the things that we need to to ensure that there is value for money? Um, and part of that was exactly what you were saying, um, Jim, which was, are we are we duplicating the payments that are going out, et cetera? And there's a whole report that gives a vast amount of recommendations. And, you know, if you need that sent out to the committee, we are absolutely happy to get that sent out again. Um, but it's a number of things that we're looking at. But the point that you raised earlier, Jim, is exactly around that, which is, have we got the right people in place? Um, to check up on those things. So are we looking and making sure that if we're filling a pothole, for example, are, have we got the expertise, the people here to challenge, um, to challenge, for example, the materials that they're using? And the PwC report was quite clear that actually we didn't, we had the under-resourced and we relied very much on GBRP to do the check-in. And I know that it's certainly been a criticism of mine that how do you have it that somebody... Um, writes the bid for a piece of work then they bid for the work and then they do the checking up of the work and it that just you know where's that critical challenge like you've been talking about um the what I, I would personally say that that's one of the significant reasons why we need to look at the contract and um I went I was actually referring I put my hand up for the first question that you asked and forgive me I've got a cold so my head is entirely in the clouds at the minute um, but one of the first questions you asked was regarding, are there services that we could take out um, from the contract? Now, John alluded to it earlier, which is that there were we did have those conversations. Um, um, th this, this whole section really isn't about BBLP. This is about that public round contract and what we require from it. But actually, BBLP, we have had those conversations about, you know, are there some services that you think, we could, that could go to the community um because we've got people not banging down our doors saying actually if you let us do it we would happily we'd happily take on those roles um and we challenged a couple of them and ended up getting some legal opinion and the legal opinion was for some of the services that perhaps bblp said yeah you could you could take them on we would actually be breaking the contract so as it's written at the moment the and you know people 10 years ago it was a different contract than what somebody would write today but that degree of flexibility about removing things and adding things in our clear advice from from council was that that would break the contract there were a couple that didn't but actually any further than that we would be breaking the contract which i guess is why we're bringing this and saying actually we need to have a full review and if there are services that we need to remove and it's going to break the contract do we make that decision and make sure that we've got that degree of flexibility written within the contract to be able to change that for both us and for the contractors at different times so hopefully that adds a bit of context to that can I just come back on that one point? Um, uh, Jamie, I did have it written down. You said it. Um, it reminded me. Uh, if we come out of this contract, um, if we do decide to, uh, what are the penalties and the pitfalls? Because I think it Jarvis, before that, um, there was a big court case about afterwards. And I think we won in the end, which is fantastic. But there were, there was, you know, lots of, lots of, lots of, I don't know how many, but there was lots of millions <coughs> that um, we managed to save. Um, but is there a risk around penalties and pitfalls if we change contractors at the end of this, uh, at the end of the natural contract? It's the, it's the right time to make any changes, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I will, if it's okay, Jim, I will pass over to Mark because I know he's got the exact dates on there, but um, it's the exact question that I asked uh, because of the previous issues. In, um, and if you think how long it took to resolve the Amy dispute, we lost a lot of offices during that time because they were fully taken up with that. So the cost just isn't money, but also the losing of expertise during that time. Um, but the, I think that one of the things that we said was, at if, what point in the contract is it time to review it? Do you wait until the end of the contract and then go back two or three years before, what do we want from it? Or do we look at the points in which we're legally 
able to do that so there's no fault clauses etc within the contract and you know it's an open book contract so people can see that um but i think mark has got the actual details on times and the dates within it which might be really helpful for context so the contract as it currently stands it's um due for expiry in august 2024 but we are working to look at the uh, BBRP have got uh, an application for two years further extension. So we're looking at that, those, those uh, that extension requests at this moment in time. I can't tell you whether that's going to happen or not, but, but we, we are looking at that and we're doing that at this moment. Um, so if there's a two-year extension, is there an opportunity there to potentially take some things out of it? With a, or, is it a, or is it a complete extension of the original contract from 10 years ago? So, so, so the contract is the contract. Um, we, we, we can't vary the contract anymore. So the, the advice we had was if we were to try and vary any further, then we're at risk of an OGU claim. So the any contractor that may have bid for this work was put off by the scope and scale could actually come back to us and say, actually, no, what you're delivering, we could have gone for. We have a claim against you against lost profit. So that's a, a risk the council isn't willing to, to go down the road on. Um, thanks, Mark. And just when the, when the con when the contract start that started them the, the ten years ago, um, I do remember a lot of people that worked for the, the company before were TP across, but there was a lot of uncertainty as well. So I think for for everybody, we need to make sure we get this done, in, if there is an extension, we get this done in plenty of time. So everybody knows what's going on. Everybody's got an opportunity then to decide whether they want to go across or stay where they are, whatever. So uh, time, um, right ahead of time for me would be a big thing because people are really worried and upset um, and concerned about losing their jobs. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and for, for us, as I say, I've been on both sides. I, I've, I've cheated people to get, I've cheated people in to a contractor and communications with staff and with interested bodies because you've also got <coughs> contractors operating locally who also want to be able to carry on a relationship. Um, it's all really important to them because they're livelihood at the end of the day. And what we don't want to do at any stage in a contract is lose good staff. Councillor Harrington, I, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I was indeed. I also just want to make a point that um, as far as contractors go, Bath is actually a pleasant company to deal with, and there have been others in the past, as you alluded to, Councillor Kenyon, like Amy, who were not so, quite frankly, in my opinion, easy to deal with. So, uh, in terms of providing that certainty, this is exactly what's important to make sure staff know that whatever happens, there'll be some, some sort of there'll be a, a job there for them. For example, we took Crow in house, not only did we bring staff back that were previously Heritage Council, went to work for Balthus and came back to us, some people who were actually employed by Balthus came across to us. So that, that's critical to all, make sure that we give full notice and any decision will take time and, and that, that will make sure that everyone's had the opportunity. Just to pick up on the WSB, sorry, on the, on the, on the issue about the St. Uh, you asked a specific question around uh, St. Mary's. So that's capital work, not revenue. So there's a slight difference yet again. but. The, the issues there were that we so so we we wanted to do that quickly because it was identified as a, as, a, as a need to make sure it's done quickly. Um, the responsibility is that that the county council makes those decisions and takes uh, advice and, and uh, direction from the local uh, parish council, and also we also check, check with the entire uh, settlement. And the response came back that they were supportive. Balfour then got that contract because that was the quickest way to do it through the framework agreement. We then, they then got WSB to do the design work. And unfortunately, everything just takes forever because, you know, suddenly there's a shortage of traffic lights and suddenly there's a shortage of this. And, so, and, there, and there was a further issue that the original design had uh, a tree coming down, which we weren't prepared to tolerate as a cabinet member, a ward member. And so that took a bit of redesign. But yeah, there are always those issues that complicate things further. And one of our jobs is to go back and to check, and this is what we are doing, to make sure that Balthus <coughs> and their subcontract WSB, who they tend to use for their design work of anything, uh, that, that they didn't see, that they foresaw everything. There wasn't something that they should have foresaw that they didn't. And so that work is always checked and it will be checked in this particular case. And thank you, John. I'll just come back on that. I mean, there are some businesses that if they go over time, there's penalties. And um, perhaps if we're looking at doing something like this, 
on the end of it, as we'll see in the tail, we should be saying, well, if you don't do it within this set period, um, we won a percentage back. Um, and I think if we did that, well, it, it would certainly shot the pencil, they'd, they'd, they'd all be on it. Um, for one way the because no business likes losing money through time. Yeah, and, and, and to be honest, those mechanisms exist now, and that's what we did at Fan Hope, and so it's what we might be doing here. Yeah. Well, we will be doing, we'll be reviewing the work and see if there's anything that could be avoided. Okay. Um, sorry, Kelsa Andrews, did you want to make a comment, and then we'll go to um, Kelsa Bowes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, regarding Councillor Kenyon and obviously the cost of St Mary's School in Nuggledyke, um, how could we say it? There was a lot of work done. There was a lot of things coming back and forwards on that. Mostly what concerned me as the ward member is communication. And this is the biggest thing I think most of us had, or literally every ward member gets, is communication from who and where. Um, it doesn't automatically come to us. It goes further afield. So it does frustrate us, because obviously we're the point of call for parish councils and everything else. So regarding with that, and obviously they had the contract, they knew the time scale, things went wrong. Hopefully that's going to be uh, looked at. I think it will be looked at in greater detail, but it is communication that we all need. That's more of a statement than a question. But if I can hop yes. on the back of your question, um, looking at asking Mark with your uh, experience of different authorities, um, I think, especially in my experience, members of the public, they just want the problem solved and then they don't know whether it's the contractor or the council and, and, and they don't know who to ask and they don't know who to expect communication from. So what Bearing in mind the communication issues that can arise with these things, what operating model, uh, in your view, would be a good one to increase better communication? <laughs> so if I take the, the two of the instances of this contract I've worked on, um, in Buckinghamshire, uh, Ringway Jacobs were contracted to deal with all of the on-contract comms. So everything comms-wise for the contract, was dealt with by Ringway Jacobs. And we had a comms team, they, they did the name of Gritter, follow Grit on Twitter, all the good stuff that you'd expect of a, of a contractor and working with their teams, because at the end of the day, it's not the comms that fails, generally, it's the people feeding the comms that fails because you can't communicate nothing. Um, so if the people who are doing the work don't tell the comms people that actually we come to start work on Monday, we, we, we failed. When I went to Cheshire East, Again, another iteration of the contract. Cheshire East insisted they kept the comms in-house. So again, it's very much what does the council want? Does the council want that level of control itself? Does it want to determine what it wants to communicate out itself and work with the provider to get that information, have those regular meetings, understand the program, understand when we hit the ground? And actually, what is it that we want to communicate? Do we want to communicate everything we do? Or do you want to communicate just the, the big things or somewhere in between? So we're just about to hit the winter season. Do we tell the public every day that today we're not gritting, tomorrow we're not gritting, we're gritting on Sunday? Do we tell? Do we want to tell the people that? And who wants to tell that? Is that a Balfour Beatty thing to go and do? Here it is, a Balfour Beatty thing to go and do. With Cheshire East, it was very much a Cheshire East thing to go and do. Thank you. And Councillor Harrington. Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, <coughs> communications is one of the things that uh, I don't think is, is always perfect. It's one of the reasons why I think we need to look at how this might work better. Um, the nature of the contract, as I said, that we gave Balthus in 2013 meant that we actually gave them responsibility for communications, not, not just outwardly in terms of our Twitter feed and what's happening and, and letting public know when works have been, been doing, uh, but generally, you know, any communications that are coming from parishes as well. And I think that's something that hasn't always been done Personally, and it's difficult to understand that it's just because you know everyone's struggling for resource. There's no doubt that we were spending probably twice as much money almost on the public realm contract 10 years ago than we are now. So are the issues that we get with comms issues that we would face if we were if we were dealing for that in-house? I don't know, but that extra layer sometimes I think causes an issue because we're having because what we're getting then, if you're gonna have your comms outsourced, then you want that 
we want that dealt with in a way that's succinct and, 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 and efficient. What we don't want as board councillors and as cabinet members is having people coming to come to us because not getting a response or not getting the right response. And a, a sort of classic example really is that, um, and Councillor Durkin and I have had this conversation about things like diversions going in. Um, we, you know, we, we would probably want a system that's a little bit better than we currently feel is, is set up, whereas, you know, someone will look at something on screen and say, right, I'll set this diversion up in a certain way. And sometimes the parameters that public ground contractors have to stick to with A road to A road diversions, etc. But, you know, we've asked that local members, particularly parish councillors, are advised in advance, not the other way around, because they need to be able to come back and say, there's no way you can do that on a certain day because there's an issue going on or we're closing something down. Uh, and I've also asked that the locality stewards who actually know the area very, very well are formally, you know, that's formally a tick box exercise that they have to be checked with. So that, that's something that Bauer said they can do for us now. It hasn't happened yet. But those are the, the, that communication issue is a big issue. And that comes back to this whole point about how much you give to your subcontractor to do and how much you should be doing yourself as a council school, really. Because essentially, are you always going to be the buck stop stopper? Well, you may well be. So maybe that's something we should be doing. I, I'm formulating a resolution in my mind, but I'm thinking that ultimately the, the, the buck does stop at the council. So I think that should form the cornerstone of the key communication strategy. But obviously that's something um, that we can mull over during the meeting. Um, right, um, Councillor Bose, oh, you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Some of this is just statements. I agree with comms, and I think the problem is a lot of the time the comms go out to the public before they go to the ward member and before they go to the parish council, and that's infuriating when the public are coming to you with something that you know nothing about. It, it, it doesn't make us look a very professional organisation. And I agree, I think that they definitely need to include the locality steward and parish councils and ward councils because actually they've got the, the in-depth knowledge of that particular area. So it's all right looking at a map and saying, oh, I've, I've done it this way. But as you say, it could be that the, there's a school event on that day and, you know, you generally know, I'm not saying we know it all, but we know what's going on. So I think flexibility, as uh, Councillor Kenyon said, is important. It is great the fact that you can have somebody working in the day and then they can go out and do gritting and then just go in for work late. That, that is a really good operating model that you've got the flexibility there. And I think that's key. And that probably does only come with larger companies. Um, in terms of value for money, I still think where the confidence is a big issue. I think the public aren't confident that we're getting value for money. And it's not always easy for councillors to defend that because we probably don't have the information either. So looking at the operating models going forward, these are things that we need to consider. And I think now is a good time to start doing this. And the key would be giving us the opportunity to review the different models that you're looking at. Because I don't think, based on this document, we've got enough information, as Councillor Durkin said, there isn't enough information to scrutinise it and say, oh, we think we should go with this, that, or the other. We haven't got that. So that next stage is key. Parish councils, my parish council in Belmont is absolutely fantastic and I couldn't praise them enough. They are very, very proactive. They do lots of work that maybe sometimes is should have been done by Herefordshire Council, but they, they do it quickly. They have a handy person. It's all done to a very high standard in consultation with our locality steward. There's a great relationship there. And I think in some times the parish would like to do more because they actually get frustrated that oh, it's going to take so long to get Herefordshire Council to do it. We've actually got the resource and we've got the fund. We'd rather do it ourselves and, and in some cases do a better job. Sorry about that. But, uh, so I think the key is giving us the information. Let's look at the different models, your suggestions, so that together with costings, but also I wanted to say there are great people working for Valtabiti and just on the last two seconds, I want to praise my locality steward to the hill, Natalie J. Fantastic, great ambassador for Valparaiso. Always available to come out for meetings with the parish and myself outside of working hours. Always makes an effort. So there are some really good people that work for Valparaiso, and I just think we should up some of them as well because they, they work really well. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Bowes. Uh, on that point, um, with a future operating model, do you see an opportunity to enhance the role of um, the locality stewards, Councillor Harrington? <coughs> well, it's interesting because, as I said, South and Recon have street inspectors and road inspectors, but I don't think we necessarily had that um, ourselves when we were operating in house. And then when Balthus took over, they were the ones who brought in locality stewards, which were, who were essentially inspectors in reality. I mean, they you know, agreed that their jobs to inspect. Um, so I suppose the question, the question I would ask is, is, is should that inspection be, um, should Heritage Council own that inspection? Is, is probably the, you know, the, the, the point I've raised before. It, you know, would, would it be, uh, would it be, uh, you know, that constructive tension that you want? And, and uh, as, other people have alluded to that was actually a good firm to work with, but is the contract right for us? And is the correct constructive tension there? So one of my, my one of my questions is: Should inspection service via locality tours come back in house or come in house? I should say because actually, as I said, Balfour has actually produced locality tours in the way that they are now, but they are highly effective. Um, they are a very good point of contact with the public. Uh, they have a huge amount of knowledge. And uh, yeah, I think there could be more value. Perhaps they could do some of the smaller jobs because technically at the moment, they are supposed to be just inspectors, but of course they might, if there's an overhanging branch, jump out and start sawing away at that branch just because it saves trying to get someone to come out. But as inspectors have said to me before, halfway through you know, an hour's worth of chopping, you think, actually, should I have done that? If we can factor in that they may do some of that work in the future, given the time, the ability, and we start offer, offer around that, that might be something to think about. Thank you. Councillor Duffy, and then Councillor Henry. Oh, can I come in on that point? Oh, yes, please do. Sorry, Councillor Duffy. I'm um, coming in on that point as well. Oh, right, okay. Well, apologies. Yeah. Uh, but... thank, thank you, thank you. Um, this is primarily for the last term, but please. Um, with regard to what you were saying, the locality students being brought back into the house potentially, and I'm aware that we are. A, in the realm of the contractual issues here, potentially. Um, but looking at item 48, line seven, it talks about a lack of interest in suppliers in any new contracting opportunities. A way that the inspections could be done would be, would be with an external contractor, directly employed by uh, Heritage Council. Has any work been done with regard to um, Tested the water. If there are count, if there are contractors out there who would be interested in being a local contractor, in addition to the main contractor that we have at the time, because we've got here just a, a, a management issue of lack of interest and suppliers. Do we know that as a lack of interest, or has it been tested, or can it be tested in in, in preparation for the more information coming forward to inform? Party committee going forward with regard to the FOA. So, in, in terms of that being a risk, there's always that risk. Um, commercial companies will look at an offer and they will, they will really, really rigorously uh, analyze what is available to them in the market at that moment in time. And it may be actually company A has, has bidding for four different offers at the moment. And this, this contract here may be the best fit in the world for them, but they've Committed so much resource onto those four bids, this one's a no go. We can't go for it. So we, we need, need to make sure that when we, if we, if if and when we go to market, whatever time that is, whether that be 2028, 2042, we make sure we go to market when we know that the the players we're looking to attract are in a position where they can come and contract with us. Um, because you don't want to be put an offer out that actually. If you put it out next year, I'd have loved to have done, but it's too soon for us. We're doing too much already. In terms of that, con another contractor looking at our inspections, I would have to ask the question, why? Um, so, so, simply because we have, you've, you've, all of you um, have concerns around the quality of work undertaken by our current contractor. 
We then move on to another contractor that we then have to supervise and make sure that contractor doing the job right for the other contractor to go and repair the things that he said are wrong. So it, it's it's about making sure we get the right mix and the right blend of, of, of contract. Where where the inspections sit, again, from my, my pure, purely my perspective, from a highway safety inspection. So remember, we've got two different sorts of, yeah. of inspector. We've got one that will come out and meet you as a, as a locality steward and we'll talk to you about problems and issues and look to resolve those problems and issues with you. So we'll try and put works through the system, provide the sufficient budget. The other part of their role is that highways inspection, safety inspection, where they'll travel every single part of the network in a year to make sure that there are no safety defects existing at the time of inspection. That element of safety inspection, from my perspective, again, operating on both sides of the fence, sits best with the contractor who is undertaking the work. I, I, I wasn't proposing that. I was extrapolating the discussion that Councillor Harrington was having about uh, tasking a powerful BT company stewards to do in house whatever the proposal is. It's just that I was just extrapolating. So thank you for that. So I can take it from what you're saying. There's been no market testing, as it were, at the moment. That, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you kind of stole me thunder a little bit, little bit there, Mark. But, <laughs> but hybrid locality stewards could could well be a good thing, but it could well be a good thing still with Balfour BT because, as John said, you know, I, I report in a branch that's overhanging when you could you can have a saw with you, saw it out, and get out of the way. It seems ridiculous, you know. And I know that they're very driven on taking pictures of photographs of everything, and you know, even when they empty the bin, they've got to take a picture, send it off, and that sort of stuff, which. Takes it's long to actually take the picture and send it off, and it's empty the bin. Um, the proof of emptying the bin is the bin's empty. So, so sometimes you can kind of over um, uh, check things. But the point you made then about different types of locality stewards, um, fantastic, and they do do good things, um, but they're not structural road engineers. I, I from working um, helping out and subbing on a, on the roads when they get done. With the gangs, you've got a supervisor will come around, you've got a Belfield guy will come along, or the gaffer's coming, you know, sort of thing. Um, the guys I've worked with do a fantastic job. I think you mentioned we think they do a bad job. I don't think Belfield do a bad job. I think sometimes communication's broken down or it takes a long time or people can't understand why I could do that in an afternoon. Why the hell haven't they done that sort of thing, you know? So let's clear that if we could. Um, but when it comes to checking things, there's, there's the engineers that go along. They're very important. I think they need to stay within Belfort BT um, because if you had someone else coming in checking the guys that are doing the work and they know what they're doing, the guys, I mean, the guys that I've worked with, they all know what they're doing and they're all fantastic at the job and they take a big pride in it. And I think that some of them were Herefordshire, Hereford Council before and, you know, and that they jump around and, and that whatever happens in the future they'll jump around they'll stay it's what they do and they're very good at it but um the, there's a difference between locality stewards and engineers that go out and check the work because they actually know what a little bit more so that's the point i was trying to make so, so, so in terms of that that level of supervision so if we were to build um a road from from hereford to the center of wales um we would have a, a, a generally have the start of the contract where we would have our own clerks of the work so they would be responsible going out to check we'd have our own section engineers that would go and check the setting out so it really is about the scale of the work we're doing as to whether you have somebody internal be that bblp or or hereford or whether it's a, a an external because you bought them in for a specific scheme so it, we need to we need to make sure we check things in the, in the right way. We need to have that audit check and we need to make sure that those people doing the audits are doing them properly. Um, so there, there is always a need for checkers and it, and it is, it's a moot point as to where they sit, depending on the style of scheme we're working on. Um, just to come back on that, if we were going to do a road into the middle of Wales, probably get Wales to do it because they're very good at building roads. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, well, they've got a lot more money to build roads, James, so that's why they are, but yes. Uh, so the point you made is, is absolutely <coughs> valid and exactly the same point that Mark made. I, I don't know how the inspections would work, how, what, how we would do things. I think I think there's two issues, as, as Mark said. There's a, first of all, the operational stuff. So it really may be better for someone who works directly for a subcontractor to be 
checking on cat A's and B's and saying, right, that definitely needs repairing. The issue is, uh, the issue I have then is that constructive tension to make sure that someone's coming across in a broader suite and saying, yeah, but I don't think the, I don't think the quality of the work done there is acceptable. Now, that would be difficult, in my opinion, for the subcontractor's employee to come back on them as, as aggressively, or not aggressively, not the right word, as constructively tense as someone who worked directly for Heritage Council. At the moment, we don't have those technical people going out checking broadly. So maybe it would be a combination of the two, I agree. Can I ask or explore, when, when considering a future operating model, I mean, looking at the council's budget this year and, and the budget work that we've got to do and, and uh, the, the, the challenges that the budget will <clears throat> create, um, in the past, the council has provided services, you know, thinking of sign making, uh, things like that, operations like that. In moving forward over the uh, future operating model, is there the scope to pick a model that could potentially be a source of income for this council? I'll answer that and I'll also ask um, Ross Cook to come in on that because it's something that is hard to make money. So on, on, on a particular point of the um, making of, of signs, we, we, we did have in Herefordshire a depot under Heritage Council and previously I think under Amy and Jarvis that made signs up. Uh, Balthus, when they took the contract on, got that responsibility and they decided it was uh, more cost effective for them to um, to to all the signs from somewhere else. I do think that's somewhere that we need to think about. Well, actually, if we brought those in house and we did it ourselves again, we could probably reuse materials. We could probably do things quicker because one of the issues we always have is if you order something, it takes a week or two weeks to get it done because you're having it come from somewhere else. It's brand new. We're not able to reuse things in the same way. And the most important thing is virtually no one is doing that at the moment. So suddenly we would have value because we could say to Gloucestershire or Morrisville House. Use our use our sign shop, and that's a way that we could make some money. Yeah, and Ross, I'm just sorry to put you on the spot, but that's sort of thing. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Councillor Harrington, and afternoon, everybody. Apologies, I missed the end of the question. So, could that just be repeated? Yes, yeah, so I was making a point about the operating model, and if we chose an operating model that had the potential to uh, create a uh, revenue stream for the council, <coughs> the example I just used, and Councillor Harrington has, has uh, 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 expanded upon, is sign making. Yeah, oh, thanks, Chair. And uh, um, for me, I think all options should be on the table, and I think this goes back to where our expertise is as, a, as an authority, but also where the, the skills in the county are as well. So um, not just with this contract, but any services that we provide, that if we're looking at those and thinking that we could probably do more if we were able to sell those services, either to lo other local neighbour neighbouring local authorities or to other sort of private contractors or vice versa, whether there's certain things that we think we're not so good at, um, I think that's certainly a model we should be looking at anyway as an organisation. So um, certainly in my area, you know, I've been looking at um, different services that we do provide that do have a commercial element. Um, things like giving advice to food standards, sort of, you know, uh, food operators. That, that there's different things that we could be doing um, to provide and enhance services to those businesses, um, and that would cut across this model as well. So. Certainly, one thing I think we should be looking at. Thank you, thank you, Ross. Right, okay. Um, just to pause for reflection, really, for the committee, just to think about the type of recommendations that we might want to be forming out of this discussion, which I think has been a really useful discussion so far in uh, teasing out some of the issues. I'm sure that there's other things that we can be. Uh, focusing on as well, but as, at this stage, has anybody got any in mind uh, uh, thoughts about what recommendations we could be putting forward? I mean, I mean, and certainly, um, there are various threads, aren't there? I mean, potentially, you might look for requests for information in terms of what we can put um, um, the situation and, and you know, in terms of development of the model. Um, so that potentially could be a request for information rather than a 
a, a recommendation to the executive as such. But I think the one resolution recommendation that, that, that you wouldn't would mind to make potentially was around the um, around the uh, communication strategy um, and uh, you know taking more responsibilities and authority um, for that in <coughs> consultation with the party stewards and parish councils and councillors in in, in um, um, formulating um, uh, you know the, the, uh, the response to activities and the promotion of those matters. Now, could I then just add a, a recommendation that in the uh, future operating model, there must be um, further exploration of the possibility of an income stream generation as part of that operating model. You don't want to be missing a trick if there's money to be made. Yeah, um, Council votes. I think we need to include in there about flexibility as well. You know the fact that parish councils and others may want to do things themselves so there's got to be some flexibility there and then the next stage is getting more of the information because as well as the pwc things we need to understand what sort of models you're considering and what the impact will be so i think we need more information on that that's okay thank you chairman um, just something i mentioned earlier about um uncertainty is bad for, for work staff and that sort of stuff just a, a long lead time into any decisions that may affect the contract whether it's to continue or go somewhere else so as much time not not leave it till october next year to say we're going to give you another two years and then you know 18 months into that two years we we then say you know we, we need to kind of make it a year ahead i would say and make it clear um, yes, it gives them. Um, I, I remember the last, the last lot, um, the last year of their uh, work here was pretty shocking, really. Um, I do remember writing a ten-page uh, thing and all the reasons why they shouldn't get um, get the new contract, and then um, they kind of did all them even more the last year. But if you give them advanced time, they can plan as well because all businesses need certainty. And they all need to plan. Remember, Balfour Beatty Living Places is a business that wants to make money. So if we're going to make a decision, um, we need to make it early and we need to be bold and we may need to get it out there. So would the recommendation be that in making decisions about the future operating model, it must be made to give um, interested parties sufficient time um, to that the time scales must in, include sufficient time for all interested parties to yeah. uh, be aware of what those alterations or changes may, might be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Any other? Oh, Michael. Michael, oh, thank you. Chair. Yes. Thank you. But just, uh, just to give some kind of summary as well to help assist the committee, I just noted that there were some key areas that. The, which you've drawn up, which I'll just to frame this slightly, but also as prelude to that, just to remind the committee that in drawing up its conclusions, it can make observations and conclusions, it can request further information as far as it wants to keep the matter under review, and it can make recommendations to the cabinet, and they are matters then be brought to the cabinet. So that maybe you can distinguish between those two things, or the things maybe you want to document. It's your key conclusions you don't necessarily wish to grant it. Um, but I think in the consideration of this issue, the committee has raised issues amongst those that have just been referenced about how the options are being drawn up in relation to the new contract. And the committee has been asked in the officer recommendation to endorse a working group as part of that because the councils are already doing. Um, and the committee has uh, reference some of the things that have already been referenced, but including I noted, uh, the whether or not the option should consider, consider locality stewards being brought back in house, mm -hmm. consider the extent to which the council is front facing in communications with the public, um, how uh, an operating model may allow greater commercial opportunities for income generation. An example was given to the rent of making of signage. Um, the, the, the options might consider the flex of the possible flexibilities within different models. Um, and also, um, further to that, 
the how the detailed proposals are being uh, drawn up uh, and, and brought to cabinet. Um, so I think within the report there is a proposal to bring this to cabinet in, in the year, but there were questions from the committee about the timing. So just to, to flag that <coughs> and the development of detailed proposals, glad that you've all got here. Um, and including another point was the matter of contract management within the new proposals uh, and the particular role that the council may have in the future operating model for its specific contract management, whether that's uh, delegated to the contractor or, or retained by the council, and the timing of the final uh, decision on the future operating model. There were questions raised by the committee about how viable that is, whether we're running out of time or whether there was plenty of time. Um, and whether or not the committee may, may wish to bring that matter back to the committee for final decisions made by the cabinet on the future opportunity. So I hope that's useful. Um, the other, one more point I did actually raise, which wasn't raised by the committee, is whether or not, in consideration of the options, uh, there were, may should be work to look at uh, other local authorities and models. I think it's possible briefly raised in question, um, but it might be a matter that we wish to, to conclude that it might be useful for the council to do in consideration of the option of thinking. I think that might be useful. No, I think that's, that's very useful. Thank you, Michael. And, and getting more examples of practice. I mean, I don't take the point that Mark was saying earlier on about it's what works for you and there's no optimum model and it's, you know, how you want to tailor make it to your needs, but it would be useful for this committee, I think, to see other operating models, um, because I think this matter should come back to this committee, uh, whether it could come back to this committee before everything may change in uh, May next year is another matter, but certainly this committee should be re-looking really at these issues and having different operating models, I think, would be really helpful. Councillor Harris. Yeah, just on that point, I mean, we, we are doing that, but perhaps not, we've not said that explicitly. So Alex Deans is uh, going to be contacting Telford and we can, uh, perhaps we can make sure that that is done more widely. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that's part of his work and Alex might want to come in and just explain that element of it because he's, he's not been taxed at all today. But, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah okay. And he was taxed with writing the report. You that. Thank you. Um, one of the things, though, that, uh, one of the recommendations we've got in this uh, pack before us is that our committee supports uh, the establishment of a cross-party uh, working group to discuss this matter. Uh, you know, I, I welcome that, and I'm sure the committee does. And um, cross-party working group, you know, um, will be good. Just, just concerned that there isn't much time left in the calendar uh, for that to actually establish anything um uh anything that's concrete to help us move forward in that short window that we've got before the council shuts down for um the election cycle but one of the things that i think has been mentioned in in passing and and councillor Bose has mentioned it so it's it's and, and it's something that i'm very passionate about is that most of my work as a ward councillor is engaging with parish councils and i'm thinking there is scope here to involve the views of parish councils with a future operating model because at the end of the day members of the public uh all members of the public use the public realm but a lot of the issues that arise arise in the forum that involves the parish councils and so i think it's really important they have a say as to what future operating models should be there. And I think that, that I would like that to be one of our key recommendations um, because they are at the end of the day on the front line, as it were. And I think it's really important that we hear what they say. Right. Um, so we've got quite a few recommendations there, Ben, I take it. And, and Michael, thank you for clarifying and adding to those because of the comments that have been made. Um, I'm keen to use every opportunity we can to ask more questions if seeing as we've got um, 
key people here with regards to the public realm and the issues that we, we have to address every day. Um, so Councillor Kenyon wants to come in with another question. Well, no, it was just a the point. You mentioned the cross-party uh, get-togethers and all the rest of it. I'm not in a party, I'm not in a group. I'm just a uh, one of a kind, as my mum says to me. You are. Uh, but I would be very interested in sitting in that group because I've got an in-depth knowledge in it. So I put myself forward to that and um, for no other reason I'd be a pain in the ass. So, yeah, so that, that's a fair point. And yeah, that's appropriate. Um, apologies for the oversight, Jim. Right, okay, so it looks like we'll be uh, welcome at that meeting, Councillor Kenyon. Right, have we got any more um, lines of inquiry with regards to the public realm contract? I think, as I said, this committee needs to be addressing this matter again once things have moved on somewhat and developed. Um, I think we've um, raised some really important issues and discussed some really important things, and we've got some recommendations. Would everyone like to see those recommendations? Yeah, Chairman, just to say what I said earlier, I would like, I would like to see them. Yes, I, I don't think this should be done in haste. This is the, the important juncture we are at. Because it could be looking at another 10 years of a, a, a contract. So I think this, we need to look at as much as we can of all information that we don't rush off and, and, and make decisions in advice. Okay. Right. Well, um, contrary to previous practice, we, we haven't got all the recommendations listed down um, to go through as we normally do. But so we've, we've had the discussion about what recommendations that we want to put forward. Are there any other recommendations that members can think about that we think we should add to the list for the executive to consider? Again, you know, this isn't uh, the last opportunity yeah. to, to contribute to this issue, but um, I think we've, we've, added, we've got quite a list uh, moving forward. Right, okay. Well, if there's no, there are no other questions, I'd just like to... Oh. So just to clarify one point, uh, Chair, does it, am I clear that the committee does want a report to come back to this committee yeah. before the cabinet mm -hmm. makes its decision? Uh, yes, yes, please. If we need a proposal, I'll propose that. Yeah, okay then. Um, well, would, would that be recommendation D? Well, yeah, uh, I would suggest that's uh, an information report request. Right, so we'd okay. like to ask that. Right, so that's a report request. Yeah, thank you for that. So the recommendations we have here is we, we, we note the um, we know the comment uh, and we commented on the uh, current model. Uh, we note the uh, requirements for a future operating model and we've responded by giving our food for thought on that one. And we are all in support of the cross party um, working party, which will include Councillor Kenyon. Uh, <coughs> uh, right. Okay, then. Well, with all of those things agreed and the recommendations put forward, um, I would just like to thank uh, Councillor Harrington and officers and Councillor Davis for your contributions and for helping us think our way through. Uh, and we look forward to reviewing the matter um, as and when we get more information and those reports come back to this committee. Right, okay then. Well, that concludes the business of the meeting, just to note agenda item nine, which dates future meetings, Friday 18th of November, uh, Monday 12th of December, and Monday 13th of uh, February 2023. Goodness <laughs> me. Well, there we go. Well, thank you.